Previously on Quest Friends. Hi, welcome to Penny and Pocket, the best ciphers in Numenera for the very best of adventurers. My name's Hamish, how can I help you today? So since I bought this caster clay thing, so I want this to have like a really big hat with like a feather coming out. So I roll at 11. That's a good fucking hat. Shock would like to use far step to just teleport up to the top of the tent and grab onto the flip stone. <laughs> Again, that's about six feet in the air, so I'm gonna need some speed defense to make sure you land on your feet. Wee! With a, mm, with a five? Mmm. Oh uh, no! Can, I, can we catch you? Yeah, me should try to catch him. Yeah. Um, I rolled a one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Misha, you smash your head against the counter. Uh, and that sounds perfect. A jar of something, we don't know what, falls on your head, and you hear Hamish go, Oh no, Gerald! <gasps> uh, if you want to build anything, you can talk to Ignatius. He's down the stairs over there. Do you have nails? Um, what? If you have nails, can you make them come out of my fists? Like your your physical fist, ma'am? Yeah, like my fist. Well, um, yes, I suppose I can do that. I won't worry, no. So after a few hours of driving through relatively plain countryside, you see in front of you a wide, shallow hill with tall, curling, greenish-blue trees. The hill is slowly moving horizontally across your vision, kind of like the moon at night, and the ground beneath you gently crests in a wave-like rhythm. As your vehicle gets closer to the hill, you realize, however, that these giant trees are instead sturdy vines dozen of feet thick and tall. They look kind of like what would happen if you took someone's hair and just magnified it. These vines tangle and curl over each other in a horrible mess that makes driving a little bit more of a hassle for Mauve, but the cluster as a whole seems to weakly point towards the sun in the sky. It takes some time, but your vehicle eventually finds its way into a small clearing, and Mauve slows it to a stop before getting out of the vehicle. At the other edge of the clearing is a shimmery thin cylinder about three feet in height. Uh, and she turns over to everyone and she says, all right, I'm gonna go uh, press that. Everyone else, stay in the vehicle. Do you listen to her? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I was gonna go touch it, but I guess if she's going to, I'll let her. She's gonna turn back to Ellie and say, all right, you can go. Yes! I wanna go and hit it. All right, so you walk up to the thin cylinder and it just has a button on top uh, and you slam on down it. Yeah. All right. As soon as it's pressed, Mob yells, all right, get back. As the cylinder slides into the ground and like a whack-a-mole, another pops up behind you. Then one on the left side of the clearing, then the right side. This continues about a dozen or more times until eventually all the cylinders pop up at once and rotate around the exterior of the clearing, whirring with increased velocity and shredding off some of the vines unfortunate enough to have crept into the clearing. Then, with a jolt, the entire clearing starts to grind downwards like a freight elevator. The cylinders have since slowed, and as you move down deeper, they follow you into the grass, then into the dirt, and finally, into Verletia. It's like looking into space, if the emptiness were somehow able to blind you. All around you are lights, lights, lights! Some built into this artificial domed horizon that covers the entire city, some coming from glimmering wet clumps of fungi that crawl alongside the walls. Below you is a giant circle that shines up into the fake sky above. It's segmented into four parts of alternating colors, a lot like a roulette wheel. Each segment, which bears its own unconventional architecture, bustles with endlessly roaming feet of thousands of humans and visitants. And while your eyes are immediately overstimulated by all these lights vying for your attention, your vision is still drawn to the largest, the fanciest, the most glamorous thing of all, a colossal platinum queen's chess piece, which stands unapologetically at the center of the whole city. But 
After a few moments, this glamorous sight gives way, as your platform sinks into a much smaller space adjacent to the city proper. This one looks more like an old-fashioned wooden train station. Behind you, drab doors lead to drably described rooms. Navigation, sanitation, HR, that kind of stuff. In front of you, half a dozen lines of folks are queued up in line to enter the city, each in front of a small arch. It's the kind you'd see before entering most theme parks. And as the elevator comes to a stop, an automated voice chimes in. Welcome to the spout. Please get out of your vehicle. And Mob turns around to everyone and says, All right, you're all time to get out. And she pushes you all out of the car and uh, says, All right, I gotta, I gotta take this vehicle and, and put it in parking. So just you all stay here and I'll be back in a couple of seconds. And she and Everett kind of bustle off. No, she bustles off with the car and Everett just kind of stands awkwardly to the side of the platform with you. Chalk is just taking in the, the splendor of the lights. Wow, I never saw anything like this in the beyond. And it's kind of funny because at this point you're in that drab room, so you can only see... <laughs> the lights from through these archways. So it's like what Shock is inspired by is one tenth of what you would see when in Rulettia proper. Shock is also pretty inspired by this <laughs> drab room. Have you seen the craftsmanship <laughs> in this woodworking? It's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as you look around, you can see that Everett is just, he has his face in this brochure. It's just buried inside of it. And as you turn over, you can actually see that there are a whole bunch of brochures kind of on the wall. A lot of are for assassin services. And they're like competing with each other. Like, you know, get one for 50 shins. And then next to it, the one like has crossed it out and said, no, 30, 20, 10, exposure. Exposure. So you see all those. But then on top of it all, you see the top row all has a bunch of brochures for Rulettia. Do any of you take that? I take one. Can I grab one of the assassin brochures? Yes, you do. The assassin is, um, the assassin, what's the assassin's name? What is the assassin's name that you pick up? <laughs> Steve Rogers. What, Steve Rogers? <laughs> what? All right, you it's find it's canon. No, <laughs> you find uh, uh, an advertisement for Steven Rogers, murder victims who don't bounce back. Um, all right, so you pick up that one. He, he beats people to death with a shield, which is very impractical, and you very much appreciate it. Um, he's, he's one of the worst. Like, he's the only <laughs> one you've heard by name, and it's usually because he's getting shit-talked. So it isn't Captain Rogers? <laughs> no. He had a cap and ship. His cap and ship was taken away from him very quickly. <laughs> Perfect. All right, you take up the brochure, proper hop. Proper. I hate you. I should say, on this brochure, there's a whole lot of advertisements, and in the center you see this big, colorful, really kind of hard-to-read map. But there is text that you can read, and, and this is what you're able to make out. Welcome, crooks and criminals! The Ninth World may have rejected you for your different ideas, your inability to conform, and your tendency to murder hapless bystanders, but in Rulettia, no dream is too small, no hunger too insatiable, and, most importantly, no pockets too deep. Our humble city is housed in the excavated chest of a baby mantle. This lucky lad landed far, far from home, burying himself barely beneath the earth's crust and swimming all around the steadfast. Now our baby buddy is home to brightly glimmering bioluminescent fungi that eat at his insides, as well as many of the ninth world's most wanted. It may seem harsh, but life's a gamble, kid, and in Rulettia this is no less true than anywhere else. Visit one of our five prime locations. A short walk from the spout, you can find Gamble Strip Navarine, a cozy recreation of the best the ninth world has to offer. Try some rhubarbian hothounds, or step back to Charmande with the line that leads absolutely nowhere. Strap for scratch? Make your future fold at the land of tomorrow, where pop-up fortune tellers and gambling games will tell you your fate and then let you defy it. Of note are the hourly unneen races. Bet on your favorite wailing mess and watch it stumble your way to glory. Note, a shimmering barrier has been recently installed around the track to prevent disgruntled customers from shooting any of the neens during the race. But why let the neens have all the fun? 
Drop on over to Piper's Pit, a primitive settlement stolen from its time by our baby mantle's hungry stomach. In the center, you can compete in gory fights to the death, and kids get their first battle absolutely free. But not all gambling is financial. If you're feeling dangerous, why not take a walk down to Manny's Prosthetic Intestine, a labyrinth of steel and guts that's been praised as the deadliest roller coaster in the ninth world. You've gambled with your scratch, You've gambled with your pride, now gamble with your life! And of course, at the center of it all is Fun Bucks Fun House and Hotel. Come on in for the most professionally rigged games and deathly deep sleep you'll ever enjoy. And don't forget to browse the newly opened Fancy Tom's Fancy Hats and Jetco Combination Store! Rouletteia, memories that will last a lifetime, lifetimes that will last an hour. This sounds like a terrible place. <laughs> Shock also says that in character. Yeah, and you would know Shock that a mantle, mantles are these creatures from the void far, far beyond. They basically are, um, they're giant planet-sized manta rays that have, have little whale-like spouts that mm. expel excess kind of like gases, which are actually good gases for humans. Kind of like how plants breathe out carbon, how like plants breathe out oxygen. That's kind of what comes out of their spouts. Oh no. <laughs> when he's done, yeah. I agree. This sounds like the worst place I have ever been. This sounds like the best place I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to eye Ellie's assassination brochure. <laughs> this guy beats people to death with a shield. Did you see this? <laughs> Everett's going to lean over. <sighs> Beating people to death with their own shield? That's so blunt and classless. And he, he points to this thing. It's like, this guy goes back in time and kills you before you were born. <laughs> now that is a class act. Hopper has, ta- has like, kind of taken the brochure at the mention of shield from Ellie and is looking at it like, how does he do that? What? I don't think that would work. <laughs> So you read it and then Mauve comes back and she has this little like coupon or key, you know, that you take when you when you put something in storage. And she says, all right, let's all get in line, get into the city. Remember, don't take anything they offer you. And so she goes forward in line and she and Everett are in front of you. So they take their place and go through those, you know, those little like spinny bar thingies that they ha- you have. Turnstiles. Yeah, they go through the turnstile uh, and then you come up and you see this very brightly faced man uh, whose face is just, it's just split in half and like opened and there's like nothing in between it. So it's like half a face, a gap, and then half a face. And he just says, well, hello, welcome to Rouletteia. Can you check in your weapons, please? Uh, not again. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you guys. You guys are good sports. Keep all your shit. We don't care. Murder is the uh, second highest paying op- occupation here. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, just come on in. Have you guys been to Rouletteia before? No. <laughs> no. Well, in that case, you're going to want one of our Easy Life brands. It's pretty simple. And he picks up this, like, you know, the stamps that you put on the back of your hand, like the come back yeah. in. He picks up a stamp, but instead of like the, the where the stamp should be, there are a dozen brightly glowing yellow lines that kind of look like a brand that would just sear you. And he says, so Easy Life is something that our mayor, good old Tommy Funbuck, put in systems because, well, we were just killing each other too often. It's part of the Easy Life model program. When you die... It'll take all your body parts, suck them inside of uh, these little lines, which will map themselves to your body, and then they'll go inside one of our pods and just make you a brand new one. It doesn't cheat death. You know, if you die by old age, you can't come back, and if if you use it too many times, you're just going to be too tired out to keep using it. But even though it doesn't prevent death eternally, it does make living just a little bit easier. It's absolutely free. Do any of you want one? I want Misha to scan this person to see if this person is a robot or a human. Okay. Because all of this is really scary. Uh, yeah, give me a roll for that scan. I haven't decided. I want to. I want to figure out. I rolled a one. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you God. know exactly what he is, and it is so terrifying, so horrifying that you want to scream and get everyone out of the city. Oh boy! And yet your mouth is forced silent. 
Oh no. All right. So yeah, that's the answer to is he human or is he uh We're just gonna just look pretty panicked and try to gesture to people, but not being able to move. Shock will notice that and like put sort of a protective arm out in front of Misha and say, <laughs> you touch us, you lose an arm. <laughs> hey, I'm just I'm just offering, it's just my job. I'm just trying to make things easier for you. And as he says that you hear a scream and you're And right in front of you, you see a guy splat onto the earth and you see a dozen pairs of green lines on the back of his hand blip up and you basically see all of his body get absorbed into these lines, which then transfer over to what looks like a a giant Tupperware container, but on its side and the lines spread out among the Tupperware container and all the flesh that had been sucked in just kind of squirts itself back out into a new body. And he's like, oh. And he brushes himself off and keeps walking. See, I'm just trying to do that for you, making things a little bit easier. So that happens often enough that you had to create a resurrection machine. (laughs) Hey, it's not a resurrection machine, all right? You cannot sue if it does not bring you back to life. Yeah, because you'd be dead. Yeah, it just, exactly. (laughs) But it just takes your flesh and it reorganizes it in a uh, less permanently scarred fashion. But as I said, the machine isn't perfect. Uh, He's going to say the machine isn't perfect. Actually, no, don't tell my bosses I said that. The machine is perfect. But if you use it too much... You uh, you probably won't come back, and it doesn't fix old age, so it does not. It does not, and he turns around to everybody. It does not cure death, <laughs> but if you do get killed, it will bring you back to life. Which is just lightly shaking at all of this. I'm gonna take my chances and not do the weird thing. You, sir. You, ma'am. He points to Shock and Ellie. Shock will charge up his laser hand. <laughs> hey, I'm just. I am doing. I, I appreciate the spirit, but I am doing my job here. Offering. You just have to say no. No, I'm. To be honest, I'm probably gonna die of old age before anyone manages to kill me. <laughs> okay, you said no. That's all you had to do. Now I just have to ask you ten more times, and you have to say no ten more times, as per company policy. Can we just start walking past him? Oh uh, yeah, you can just walk. I'm through. just gonna like, walk oh, past him. <laughs> that was always an option. <laughs> <laughs> I want to whisper to Shock. You can still shoot him from here. I probably won't, though. But you could. <laughs> he might not deserve it. He didn't try to touch any of us. And um, just just is going to mentally say to Sock, I don't like this place. Let's all be careful. But just to Sock. Because <laughs> they, they, they don't want to, they don't want that thing to hear them. Shock will nod and mentally respond like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll watch each other's backs. We'll stick together. All right, so you walk past them and you enter into Gamble Strip Navarine, and it is weird. You see a whole assortment of just weird ass stuff. The whole thing is like a fake recreation of a ninth world town, but it's filled with humans you've never seen before and at least a thousand visitants every second. To your right, you see what looks like a large green Sour Patch Kid eating a bag of a smaller versions of himself. So basically a visitant who looks like Sour Patch Kids eating a bag of Sour Patch Kids. Robot signposts with maps and other informations bob back and forth on their poles as if dancing to some invisible song and every other alleyway seems to have a deal that's gone bad down it and these bad deals are especially prevalent right next to the easy life pods in fact you see one woman who's sitting in like a a typical chair next to an easy life pod and every time her rival comes out she just shoots him with a revolver in which point he gets revived again and they just keep on repeating this every 15 seconds oh no but mauve keeps uh pushing you forward to that giant platinum queen chess piece you saw earlier, which you would recognize as Fun Buck Fun House and Hotel. And as you walk inside this giant tower, you're struck with this gaudy bright red carpeting with platinum banisters and handrails. Essentially, take any place in a hotel where gold or literally anything else than the red shag carpeting would be, and it's platinum. It is solid, 100%, absolutely, maybe real platinum. The air is running with the sounds of slot machines and grumbling patrons. It has some machines that we would expect. It has slots, and there's like a crane game that's full of ciphers and artifacts. But then there are some that are more weird. Like there's one machine that just like has two hands, one picking up someone by the scruff of their collar, and then the other punching them in the stomach as just bills of money come spewing out of their mouth. 
Uh, but up some steps, you find a circular space with balconies that stretch many, many floors above you. And in the center stands a giant fountain with the water shooting up to make the moving shape of a giant man in a top hat as tall as his torso. And he's just pointing around saying, hey, it's me. Tommy Funbuck. Hope you have fun in my casino. Check out the hotel and win some cash, cash, cash. Spend it on my fancy Tom Fancy Hat store. And you can also get some Jetco swag there well. Though it's not as good as my swag, of course. Just swag on your swag over there and get some new swag. I've changed my mind. This place is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in addition to the statue, there are like normal human sized versions of him, kind of like a, a dozen of them around the fountain, which also is very wet around it. And as Maul walks up to the fountain, one of these smaller Tommy Funbucks appears and is like, hey, I'm the Tommy Funbuck IT system. How can I help you spend all your scratch today? And she just turns over. She's like, I cannot deal with this shit today. Can one of you just ask him? Can one of you just ask him where the store is? No. Where is the store? Well, I'm glad you asked, Mr. Hopperscotch. Ruletia has over a hundred versatile stores. So what store are you looking for? Why do you know my name? Hey, hey, everybody knows the devilish Hopperscotch here. No, that was weird. I didn't like that. Well, of course, you know why. Swag. <laughs> Where is the store? <laughs> what store, Hopperscotch? Uh, what store are we looking for? Uh, Ma was just gonna say, he, just the biggest, the biggest store. The biggest store. Oh, that would be Fancy Tom's Fancy Hats and Jet Coat Combination Store. You just wanna swag your way over to that corner, and you can see there's, uh, there's a couple of doors. One is leading to a hotel, and then there's a giant door that's just adorned with the words, Fancy Tom's Fancy Hats, and then in, like, font, 20 times smaller, Plus Jetco. <laughs> He's like, just swag on your way over there and you'll have it. Okay. Thank you. In fact, Mr. Hopper, let me show you the way. And the fountain steps out. But as soon as it steps out of like the fountain space where it's like shooting up the water, it has nothing to maintain its composure. <gasps> so it just splashes onto the ground <laughs> and joins the giant puddle that's around this fountain. You think that's probably a programming error that happens a lot. Okay. Can we just leave it there? Uh, I mean, you can't pick it back up. It is gone. <laughs> okay. We'll go to the store, I guess. Shock will just, like, pick up, like, the hem of his robe so it doesn't get, like, caught in the puddle <laughs> as he steps through it. Ellie had her fist up to, like, punch it and looks a little disappointed that it's now just a puddle. <laughs> All right, um, so you all walk through these giant doors, and you're in basically a giant department store. It looks almost identical to Walmart, including that ceiling that just doesn't bother to hide any of the internal wires or ventilation systems. And a droning, simplistic 10-second melody just plays on repeat over and over and over again. And as you walk in, a salesperson with a Technicolor Newsboy cap and a vest approaches you. He looks a lot like a large bullfrog with colorful gills that fan out the side of his head. He hops forward on two sets of sturdy frog legs and waves with an extra pair of supplementary arms much higher than his torso. And he says, You have now entered Fancy Tom's Fancy Hats. You're welcome. Hi. Uh... Hi! <laughs> Feel free to spend all of your scratch on any of our wonderful services. Okay. I have a hat. Thanks. Oh, can I look at Everett and be like, I promised you a hat a while back. <sighs> I don't even want one anymore. Okay. And you, as he says that, he sidles closer to you. <laughs> Let's get going. Uh, where are your hats? I'll ask the thing that greeted us. Why, hats, they're everywhere, but mostly they're under that giant hat over there. And you can just see a giant hat in the center of the store that's kind of like overhanging everything else that's just ah. labeled, all hats are here. <laughs> ah. All right. <laughs> and then he's going to turn over to Ellie and be like, you certainly have a hat, ma'am. We have a very equitable hat return program if you want to take part in it. We even take disgusting old broken hats. Shock is going to like immediately walk by with Misha like, oh, we should all go look for something else now, shouldn't we? <laughs> uh, Mav, Ma where, where would we find the granulated azure? I'll take care of that, honey. You guys just, just have a good time and, and we'll meet back when we're done. I want to crack my knuckles <laughs> and stare at the frog guy. Okay. So you're all free to go shopping now. Um, it's a lot like a grocery store. So instead of penny in pocket where, you know, you would buy something and then immediately get it. In this case, uh, you're going to put it inside your cart 
which you'll then hold on to, and then you'll purchase at the very end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then the only other thing to mention is that Roulettia's currency, um, I'm actually going to do this as an advertiser. Hi, this is the Roulettia information system. Just here to let you know about our currency, Scratch. Scratch is a kind of paper currency that will get you a lot farther than those simplistic shins. You get a lot more bang for your buck, as every shin is worth 63 scratch. What a bargain! And there are machines all over where you essentially can trade out your shins for scratch. A hyperinflated currency because everyone keeps on printing more of it. So you have the shins that you have now. Uh, if you have any experience, you can spend one experience for five shins. If you want to do any conversion there. I'm going to trust you to keep track of what you spend and, and how much shins you have. That makes sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go shopping. break for episode 20 of quest friends i am kyle your gm and very tired moving boy i was moving this past weekend which is why this episode is a couple of days late but it's here now and the intro and outro music it uses is friends and hitoshio both by miracle of sound even better the song that played when the party first went into roulettea called messing with the best is also by miracle of sound we've got a pretty big announcement and call to action this week because as of this past weekend quest friends has officially passed 10,000 downloads it's past quiet hours so i can't be like super loud but yeah that's me screaming, like doing doing like a like a like a like a crowd. Like a Okay, that just sounds like I'm like I'm a hisser. Whatever. Anyways, we've had 10,000 downloads, which is a super big deal and super exciting, and we're we're super thrilled. We're we're over the moon. This is very strange to us. And to, to celebrate, we are giving away one set of Monty Cook Games dice. So they have three sets. They have a set of Numenera dice, a set of the Strange dice, and a set of Cypher System dice. And since we couldn't decide which one was our favorite, we figured we'd just let the winner choose which one of those three dice sets they'd like. The link to this contest can be found below. It's one of those really simple Gleam ones where it encourages you to visit our website, visit our Twitter, our YouTube, our other social media accounts, because we have a lot of them now. So all you got to do is register by noon central on Sunday, August 5th. That's that's the day before next episode. And then on next episode, during this announcement break, I will announce the winner. And then I'll email that person later that night so they know they got it. So really encourage you to check that out. Not only do you get cool dice as a thank you for being so supportive of us, but you also get a link to all of our cool social media accounts, including, and I want to put a spotlight on this, our Tumblr, which now has an open ask section. So encourage you to check out that Tumblr, check out that giveaway by Sunday August 5th. And again, the link will be in the description below. So that's a pretty big announcement, and that's all I've got for you today. So thanks so much for listening to episode 20, and I will see you again on Monday, August 6th. See you then. Jarvis, the way I see it, we have two significant problems ahead of us. First, I don't think we understand how economics work. <laughs> I want to learn more about this inflation and why all of these currencies that people just make more of lose value. Second, we need to learn about the human art of haggling and how we can do this better.
I also am severely unexperienced with financial exchange. So I would like to also learn about this art to be able to get the most out of this strange place. I believe that if we divide and conquer with our data sphere searches, we can find all of the answers to the questions we have. <laughs> I will approve of this. Let us try and find what this all means. All right. Which of us wants to look up how to haggle? <laughs> um... Can I use my new skill to get <laughs> to get skilled at haggling? Yes. So uh, you can get trained in haggling for the remainder of the scene, which will be while you're shopping. Okay. I, as an out of character person, do, do not know how to do this. So this will be very interesting. <laughs> uh, as you reach the data sphere, just a rush of images even more overwhelming than uh, Roulette itself rush into your brain. Images, pictures, sounds of people haggling. And above it all, you just keep on seeing this hunched over woman with, with a gray <laughs> face. Oh no. And like literally her face is growing more gray and pale. And you get all this information and you think you're a little bit better at haggling. Okay. While Misha's doing that, can Shock um, contact the nano spirits then? Actually, I'm gonna give you another. I'm gonna give you another GM intrusion. Oh dear! Who do you give the other point to? I give this other point to Ellie for her truly excellent speech on the boat. It's <laughs> a good speech. So you reach out for help. Uh, and what was it you were specifically gonna ask? I was going to specifically ask why is Scratch worth so much less than Shins, even though Shins are also backed by nothing, and you can make more of them just by finding shiny bits of plastic on the ground. So you call out, asking for help, and suddenly you feel a large slam on your back as Lowell says, Hey, buddy, I didn't know we were going to be contacting each other so soon. You need my help? Shock just takes, like, the hands off his temples where he was concentrating and says, I wasn't actually calling you. Oh, he looks genuinely a little hurt at that. Well, I, I can probably still help you out. What's, what's your problem? Okay. Why is the currency here so different from the currency in the Steadfast? It's all just garbage people found on the ground. Wait, you, you're calling Shins just junk you pick up from the ground? Well, yeah. Well, in the Beyond, maybe. But in the Steadfast, it hasn't been like that for a while. <laughs> Come on, man. Know your history. In the past, people could just pick up anything shiny or dust something up to make it look shiny. And there we go. They have fake Shins. But after that, it was super hard. So Roulettea, they realized that paper currency was easier to make up. So they, they use that because it's super easy to just write down whatever amount you want. And uh, that's another good question. How old are you? Well, uh, huh. I plum forgot. <laughs> Isn't that something? I guess that is something. All right, let me know if you need anything. Okay, buddy. Hey, you still figuring out what story you're going to tell me about yourself? When I was little... freshwater seas uh, in the beyond. And I remember I was a little confused at first because the information from my tutors and from the data sphere said that water from the sea had salt in it and so it would burn open cuts. So I didn't want to wash like my scratches in there for a while and I got sick because of it. Horace was very mad at me. Horace? He found me out in the wastes when I was little. That, that was it? He was just a dude that found you? Well, he raised me. I mean, the whole community did, but him more than others. Shock. Well, a little bit of advice here. You can save words like that by just use, calling him your dad. Would have made it a lot simpler. And Shock looks away like he hasn't really ever thought about this before. Dad, that's, that's a word bit for humans. Y yes, yes, yes. And... Shock just sort of blinks at him for a bit. All right. Well, let's just let's just get to the whatever. This is a store. Let's get the fucking shopping. So Shock is now going to turn back to Misha, presumably because <laughs> we finished up these conversations at the same time. Well, I still haven't learned anything about dynamics <laughs> at all. But maybe we can buy something good here. Worry not. I am quite an expert at the art of the haggling at the moment. <laughs> no. So I will get us all the things that we need. Oh. Uh, perfect. <laughs> We should know. I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, let's go shopping. I'll buy the Gorg socks. 
Shock will just ask if Misha thinks they look nice. <laughs> Alright, so Tom, how do the Gorg socks work? Alright, so the Gorg socks are a pair of socks adorned with the frowning face of a balding man. When placed on a creature or object, the target takes the appearance of the balding man, but does not change size or shape. Additional faces can be used to make other disguises, and those faces are added by placing the sock on whoever you would like to make a disguise of. Once the face is added to the sock, it can be used as that disguise indefinitely. But it has a uh, 1 in d20 depletion roll every time a new face is added. Alright, so you go and grab these socks, which seem almost to, like, groan as you pick them up. <laughs> like, uh... Uh, and as, as you're picking them up, you actually turn over and you see, next to you, you see other clothing. You know, you see some pants, you see some socks, you see some shirts, and then you also see some tri-top chest binders. And looking through them, you see the large, friendly figure of Ignatius, who was the blacksmith from the Penny and Pocket Penny Brothers shop. I want to go and slap Ignatius on the bag and be like, hey! Well, hello! Oh, hello! Ma'am, it's a pleasure, it's a ple- it is a pleasure, <clears throat> pleasure to see you today. You remember me? Yeah, yeah, yeah but yes, I, yes, I do. Oh. I'm gonna clench my fist and so the spikes shoot out and be like, remember? And kind of wave it around. I was about to ask what brings you to Verletia, but uh, I don't think I need to anymore. <laughs> I'm not murdering anybody today, actually. Well, I, I'm I'm very glad glad to hear that. So you're all on vacation too? Is not my first choice of, of destination. Every year we get to pick a day off and tatter top got to chose this year. <laughs> I'm enjoying it as best I can, but Hamish isn't taking it too well. And he points over and you see you see this large like box that kind of looks like a dunk tank, and it's just called the Killjoy box. And inside of it you see as like a sa- you know the sample person you put inside of a inside of a picture the stock photo yeah. as the stock photo the sample of how this works inside the killjoy box you just see Hamish sitting there with like a little lemonade stand that says penny in pocket uh, and he has just like a little briefcase to his side and Ignatius just says yeah my little bravey brother just can't stop working it seems well, it was nice to catch up with you. And he grabs a, a handful of uh, white and black chest binders and goes on his way. So there's something I want to buy from Jetco. Okay, you walk in uh, to the Jetco side of the store and what was super fancy and nice, now the 10 second beat is like five seconds long and it's just so much more drab. And you can tell that Tommy Funbuck, the owner of Fancy Tom's Fancy Hats, clearly wanted this part of the store to look inferior. But what do you want to buy from uh, Jetco? A, a bag of something has caught my eye and I open it a little to reveal <laughs> hundreds of spoons. Yeah, read the description for that. All the spoons you would need made out of almost every substance imaginable. It's just hundreds of spoons. All right, you pick up those spoons. And then I just want to kind of like cradle it in my arms like this is <laughs> this is really exciting. All right, are you going to stick it in your cart? No, I'm going to hold it. Okay, what else are we getting? Amisha is going to see this t-shirt that it just interests me as an out-of-character person, and so it interests Misha as well because I have no idea what it does. So it's the Many Mantle t-shirt that no. it just has a face, and whoever wears it is doomed. I don't understand much about it. Yeah, so the doomed is one of the descriptors. You know, like, you can be, like, a clever nano who... You can also be a doomed something. Yeah. So whenever you are wearing that shirt, it is such a nerdy shirt, especially in this town full of, like, hardened, like, criminals and murderers and stuff, that you get the doomed trait. So you will get all the benefits and all of the drawbacks of having that trait. Right. Because wearing that t-shirt is basically you screaming to life, punch me, I deserve it. <laughs> okay, well, I feel like that's a thing that might be fun to have. Yeah, so you'll have to tell me whenever you have it uh, on or off. Do you put it on? Yeah, well, I want to put that on. Then I also want to grab the Brilliance Cloth, which it obeys the thoughts of anyone touching it, has the ability to slowly change shape and color, but not consistency. A major change requires about 10 minutes. A garment of Brilliance Cloth can be made into any other garment, for example, but it can't be made protective. And I want this since I have the one hat that I think 
I didn't think it was one use last time I checked, right? The one that, that shifted into my... Like the disguise kit? Yeah. I had like a, a specific hat. Yeah, no, the disguise kit will work, but every time you try to do something unique, like making a hat, you have to roll a depletion roll. But you yours hasn't broken yet. Okay, cool. Yeah, then I also want to complement with a brilliance cloth as well. So I'm going to grab that. So you walk up to buy it and you see Hamish, he sees you and he gets excited and he perks up and you see him start to mouth. Hi, welcome to Penny and Pocket. My name's Hamish. How can I help you today? But he pops up and he starts mouthing that and you can't hear him say anything. Okay. And you see him sigh and you see him point. You see him point to this button on the outside. That's just this bright red button. Okay. Uh, I guess we just going to press it. All right. He's going to sign and say, the Killjoy box is, uh, only lets you hear me if you you choose to hear me. That's why it hides killjoys. <laughs> all right, what do you want, Misha? Oh, uh, f- first of all, I appreciate you remembering <laughs> my nomenclature. It spared me the time of introducing myself once again. <laughs> of course, I remember all my best customers, even if they do kill my best friend. <laughs> and you can see an empty jar where Gerald was last time you went to Penny and Pocket. <laughs> oh, Misha's gonna kind of ignore that and say, well, um, I see that you have a quite unique cloth and I would like to purchase that. Oh, absolutely. He reaches in to this briefcase and reaches down really far and he pulls up the brilliance cloth and he says can you can you press the other button and right beneath the big button there's another smaller it's a switch it's like a light switch okay we're just gonna do that uh you press it and at the bottom you know kind of at the bottom of like uh vending machines how they have the little part that slides out and lets you grab whatever you bought from the vending machine oh yeah yeah he he pushes the cloth through a slot like that and takes your shins cool sounds good i also want to get something from penny in pocket okay what are you gonna buy So I've got my arm full of spoons, and I spot the Larder watch, which is a small golden pocket watch that digitizes things, can be used to store one object up to the same size as the user. Whatever is stored is kept out of time and space, hence the name. The technology was originally used to store food. After pulling out a stored item, the player must roll a d10. If they get a 1, the Larder watch no longer works. Okay. You go to Hamish and you buy that. Yeah. And then what are you going to (laughs) do? Can I put the spoons in it? (laughs) Yeah, you can. Are you trying to smuggle the spoons? Yes. Oh, no. (laughs) This is a very advanced security system. Give me a dex or an int or some kind of roll to successfully steal the spoons. Fine, I'll pay for them. But I'm going to haggle hardcore. So you pick them up. And then you see the frogman uh, with the newsboy cap from earlier pop up and say, would you like to put those in your cart? I don't know. Will I get to keep them? Well, absolutely. Is there any chance that they're going to be taken? <laughs> absolutely not. Okay. I'm going to put them in the cart. All right. Stick them on in. And he lifts back and he opens up his <sighs> wide mouth and you suddenly see his name tag, which just reads cart. <sighs> <laughs> Ellie's gonna dump the spoons in roughly. Thank you. Do you want to put your socks in there too, sir? And he turns over to Shock. No, I like carrying them. All right, you're a moth, but if someone mugs you, you will still have to pay. I can live with that. All right. Oh, looks like someone just bought them and needs to put it in their cars. And he hops away. So quick question, does Ellie still run on the rules of she needs like mechanical repairs to heal back some of her pools when she loses, takes enough damage? Misha does, but Ellie works on the rules of Gollum healing from the Strange Core rule book. So she basically, she can't have her first healing roll of the day. Gotcha. Okay. That actually makes this even even clearer. So, uh, Shock is going to wander over to the to the Killjoy Zone, to the Penny and Pocket, say hi to Hamish, and then he's going to pick up a major glow globe for ten shins and a canister of spray metal for five shins. All right. So, what do those do? A glow globe is a orb shaped device that illuminates everything in short range with soft light. It can hover in the air on its own. It can be attached to things. Uh, and a major glow globe will just keep going. Uh, it's it's the energizer of the Nine world. <laughs> <laughs> That's not part of the actual tagline. I made it up. 
I'm very proud of it. Um, spray metal is basically a canister that heals machine bits. It you spray foam on it and it repairs machine bits. So presumably it would heal the same amount as spray flesh, right? Yeah. Okay, so it would just heal five, six points, then, because I want the cheap one. Okay. You buy both those things, and Hamish hands them on over to you, and he seems pretty happy with himself, and he's like, "Man, this is the best vacation ever, right, Jer?" Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And now he's sad again. Oh no. Oh no. Poor Hamish. All right, anything else, uh, Ellie or Shock, anything else you're going to buy? I think I'm good with my... Okay, Hopper Scotch, what yes. you going to get? I would like the Time Crisps. All right, what are the Time Crisps? The Time Crisps are potato chips that, when eaten, allow their user to crunch time and loop back up to one turn, where they can make a minor change, either by re-rolling a former action or making up a brand new one. Anyone not using the Time Crisp will notice any changes that might have occurred, but will not remember how they were made. And the number of crisps in a bag is determined by rolling a 2d4 plus 2. Okay, roll me 2d4s. All right. Do well, I have a d4? I have a d6, but not a d4. Let me pull up. I could roll a d4 for you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Roll 2d4 for me. All right. I will roll this d4 twice. That is a 2 and a 4. Nice. All right, so you can use them eight times. Yeah, boy. And in addition to the time crisps, I would like the very nice socks. What are the very nice socks, Helly? <laughs> socks that provide an asset to all social roles against a target for the remainder of the scene, assuming you can get the target to look at them for five seconds or longer, recovered from a dangerous mirror. Uh, when I was laughing to myself earlier before we did the warm-up, I had just noticed the if you can get the target to look at them thing with the very nice socks. So my question is, do you have to be wearing them? Hot damn, I guess you don't. <laughs> yes! Oh no! I'm very concerned. Got me some socks! What have I done? <laughs> I could have just said yes to either. Oh no! You've made the right choice, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't need to have a depletion roll for those. Those aren't that powerful. <laughs> okay, I would like to, from Penny and Pocket, I would like to buy the social adamant clothing for 20 shins. What is that? Uh, adamant silk can be used on clothing to make it five times as strong as extremely resistant to stains and dirt. Due to your extreme cleanliness, all social interactions become one step easier. Cannot be combined with combat type adamant clothing. Yeah, that sounds good to me. So you write that down and Hamish writes a little note on his hand to tell Ignatius to start work on that adamant clothing. Okay. And it'll be ready for you uh, next arc when you come into the store. Woo! Okay, so hang on. I'm double checking my character sheet. Okay, yeah. And then I had I had 5 XP, so I traded 2 XP for 10 extra shins. Just so we're on the same page there. Okay, yeah, I had enough. Okay, you got everything you want? Yep. All right, so you still have to get a hat, don't you? Sure do. So this whole time, Everett has been sulking behind you, and he's been occasionally moving a little bit closer and, like, kicking the back of your heels because <laughs> he doesn't want to say that he wants to get a hat, but he really wants <laughs> to get a hat. Do you want to get a hat? <sighs> Fine. If you're going to make me. Yeah, I'm going to make you. Let's go get a hat. All right. <laughs> You are trying your hardest to be cheerful and it is not responding. <laughs> oh, dad. All right. Uh, so, yeah, let's just play out the scene. Okay. Uh, how about this one? And I'll pull down whatever random hat is there. <sighs> so tacky. Like tacky in a you really hate this way or just tacky? He doesn't say anything. He just looks at you. Okay. We'll put it back. Uh, how about this hat? Uh, I guess that that one is, it would make me look pretty cool. Maybe. Okay. Do you, do you want to try it on to see if it makes you look pretty cool? No, not in public. <laughs> How are you going to know if you'll like it if you don't try it on? Because <laughs> I just know, okay? It's okay. It's an okay hat. Okay. How about this hat? <laughs> are, you, are, are, you, are you trying to just make my life miserable? No, I'm trying to do the opposite. Okay, because it feels like you're trying to make my life miserable. Why don't you pick What's out that? a hat that you like? And he just goes down the line. Boring, bland, bleached. I, I, this one shouldn't even be for sale. And then this, and he picks up a propeller beanie. This is the most disgusting, horrific, horrendous thing I have ever seen in my life. And he's gripping it really strongly, and he struggles putting it back. And he's just like, let's just go home. Uh, okay. I'm gonna pick up the propeller beanie and be like, 
Hopper is genuinely confused about he's he's like, should I try reverse psychology and pretend I hate the hat <laughs> as well? Yeah, I'm gonna do that. And he'd be like, Yeah, you're right. This is the worst hat I've ever seen. Well, okay, it's not the worst. I was exaggerating. And I mean it's got colors. A lot more than you do, brown coat. What is Everett wearing? Is it all black? <laughs> it's all black. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna look at him and raise an eyebrow and be like, a little bit like a pot calling a kettle black, but okay. Uh, (laughs) Black is cool because it's all the colors. You would know that if you learned things. Read a book for once. (laughs) That is a cool fact that you told me, Everett. (laughs) It's not that cool. And you can see he's a little, he's blushing a little bit. He's, He's a little excited that you called something you said cool. Well, I think this hat is priced well and then he'll check the price is it priced affordably is it okay or is it like oh no it is 20 shins that is an expensive hat a full that suit is, of armor <laughs> that is as expensive as the clothes hopper just the fancy silk for his clothes that he just bought uh he'll be like i think it's priced reasonably mm. do you hate it enough to buy it <sighs> yeah he's taking such a i'm just gonna like push it at it be like all right let's go <laughs> You start walking back to the front and he is like fidgeting with it mm-hmm. and he's like telling facts and he's trying to be bored by super excited. He's like, oh, did you know that apparently if you're small enough, this, this will like let you fly or whatever. <laughs> and you can like, Mr. Mako said that you could remote drone it or whatever. I don't know. It sounds pretty boring to me. Like it's, it, I mean, it has so many colors and like you can <laughs> see all of them, which is I think, cool, I guess. Uh, and he's just saying that. And as you walk by, and I'm assuming you kind of meet up with the rest of the party and you're all on your way back. Yeah. But while he's while he's doing this, I'm going, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. No, it, <laughs> I, it's, it does sound cool. It's simultaneously what you do to get a kid to stop talking, but Hopper's also genuine about it. He just doesn't want to appear that genuine because he has no idea how to act around Everett. All right. You're uh, you're going to walk to the front of the store. Um, Do you do anything before you reach the front of the line? Uh, Right. Yeah. So as uh, Misha is going to just be looking around and then they are going to their gaze is going to stop in this hat that's standing out to them from the rest of them and it is this really nice looking vest they don't really see anything that is peculiar about it they just like the color it's like a really bright red vest and they think they, they try it on and they try it on for a little bit they really like it and so they just toss it in the cart not knowing exactly what it would do as you throw away just cart like pops up out of like a stack of nearby t-shirts he pops out of a stack of nearby t-shirts is like a predator popping out of the grass and he just goes whoa and it falls straight in his uh gullet and he just keeps on running all right all right what does what does the fez do the fez it's actually called the fez of infinite hunger it willingly consumes shins from its wear occasionally giving out minimal rewards no one has yet found where the money goes uh <laughs> for every five shins the player rolls a 1d 100 they have 20 percent chance oddity one out of 20 60 percent chance cipher 21 to 80, 90% chance artifact, 81 to 99, and 1% chance of getting any oddity cipher or artifact of their choice so long as it can be purchased at other shops, can be found in the rulebook or is approved by the the GM. Yeah, you grab that hat. When you put it on at first, you could have sworn you could have fate, mmm, yes. (laughs) Boy, that's terrifying. (laughs) But that voice goes away as soon as you take it off and throw it. It's like a, mmm, yes. No, wait, wait. (laughs) And it it gets thrown away. All right, uh, you're at to the front of line and then cart pops up and you're like whoa hello there <laughs> and like just outside of his gullet all the things that you decide to put in your cart just pop out onto the onto the like little checkout area and he calculates it and is like well this will cost you and he says however however much you have to pay subtracting the stuff you bought from penny in pocket misha i mean i, I misha is gonna try and say well that seems like a reasonable price, but I do believe that... Oh, no, actually, no. Before Misha does that, uh, they are going to take this elderly woman's voice because that is what they associate with haggling. Uh, and then they're going to be like, all right, but hear me out here. This sounds like a perfectly reasonable price, but I believe that getting all of these items together mean that we can get a discount as it seems that they are group together and we are giving a lot of benefits to your store 
Therefore, I believe that getting all of these things together, marriage, and then they are going to offer 10% of discount price of whatever the price that they said was. Hopper looks genuinely impressed that Misha knew what a bulk discount was. <laughs> Can Shock provide an asset to this? What, what, is Hawk, what does Shock want to do? I kind of want Shock to just like very slowly slide one of the coupons we were showed <laughs> earlier across the counter. Just really slowly slide up coupons. Oh yeah, I, I guess we all have this coupon. Well, uh, well, the coupons are for specific things. Yeah. Right. You could try. Okay, so you want to try to apply these coupons? Yes. We don't have to. That was my dumb idea. Okay, no, that, that'll be an asset. I, I can justify it. All right, all right, give me a roll. Okay. I got a five, so... But one step better from from my asset? Uh, uh... Yeah, so it would have been two steps easier because you were trained in haggling. True. Um, And he's going to look at you and going to be like, well... I haven't seen these coupons anywhere before. I mean, they seem legitimate, but we aren't five finger coupons. So that I don't think that would apply for us. And I don't think there's a bulk discount. This is very difficult for me because, I mean, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't, nobody's asked for a discount before. They usually just steal. <laughs> Well, there's always a first time for everything, isn't there? Plus, isn't it better for you if we get you some money as opposed to no money? Therefore, I think that it's better to apply this discount to us because otherwise we might just steal it anyways. I want to chip in. I was gonna steal this, but I didn't. <laughs> oh, well, um, how about... Five finger coupons? What if I did five percent? Mish is gonna be like, hmm, that is quite an interesting offer. <laughs> How if we settle for seven percent? Well, seven isn't an easily divisible number. How about six percent then? Well, six also isn't. It's really multiples of five that are easily divisible. Misha is right. I, I, I can help with the divisions is the, if that is something that seems a problem to you. Uh, I'm an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that sounds fair with me. We'll do what percent were we gonna do again? Um, I believe it was eight percent. All right, eight percent it is. Uh, and you check out everything else, and you will get back eight percent of the money that you spent. And I'm assuming you you already went through the exchange machine and got this money back. I assume that probably. So in that case, um, you'll we'll figure this out after the fact. But you're basically gonna have to calculate how much money you had. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. You're gonna have to calculate how much money you spent on things at the store, not at Penny and Pocket, because you already paid for those. Right. And then you will have to convert that into scratch, because scratch machines don't convert money back to shins. What have you done? So you're stuck oh, with this useless no. fun money. Oh no. <laughs> I'll treat that as a GM intrusion. So Ari, who do you want to give your other point to? Um, I think I am going to give it to Hopper because he had to deal with Everett's nonsense. <laughs> All right, so you all meet out up front. Mauve has done some shopping. Uh, she says, well, I, I wasn't able to find the granulated Azure. I'm going to do a little bit more hunting. I mean, it looks like looks like we got some time to kill. So how about we head out and we meet back here in a couple hours? Sounds good. Uh, Seems fair. Yeah. Sounds good. I'm going to take Everett with me. Uh, I, I think he's a little overstimulated. <laughs> and as you can tell, Everett is actually kind of holding his breath, which is an actual like anxiety response to being around so many people for so long. He's just been hiding it successfully fully this whole time. Just gotta keep him close at hand, make sure he doesn't get in trouble. But I'll see all of you in a, in a little while. Yeah. Unless we get murdered. Unless that happens. Well, if you were gonna get killed, it would have happened by this point. Hmm. Um, that feels like a camera look moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a camera look. And they all walk away and you have your Rouletia brochure. So what are you all gonna do? Uh, before we part, can I just look at, I just want to compliment Misha on their haggling, like in character. Hopper is very impressed. He's gonna turn to Misha and be like, that was incredible. Wh when did you learn to haggle? Thinking back to the, Misha has a kazoo that they clearly got swindled all their money out of buying. Yes, I happen to be quite an expert at the art <laughs> of the haggle. And... <laughs> I expect this to be useful in many other situations. They are not going to say that this is going to be a thing that's going to get lost. They are just going to pretend that this is a thing that they are now good at. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to do that. We can move on now. Cool. So you all take a look at the brochure and you have some time to kill. You see a, a, a whole host of locations, which I've, I've sent to you in that little brochure description area. And you also shock. You see actually in the advertisements, you see an advertisement for someone called the Great Vespari, who is 
performing in Piper's Pit. And uh, the tagline for that says, Fake Esoteries, Real Magic. Shock is going to gasp a little bit <laughs> upon seeing that. Like, is that a stage nano? I've, I've never gotten to see one of those before. And Shock's going to turn to Misha and say, do you want to go see a stage nano? Sure. I have also never experienced this sort of human before. And then Misha is going to put on his new, uh, their new hat and their new mm, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> shirt. God. <laughs> to be ready to go to that with Sock. And then what are Ellie and Hop going to do? I am interested in either prosthetic intestine or land of tomorrow okay i'm deciding between the land of tomorrow and manny's prosthetic intestine i don't know what do you want to do i kind of want to go look at the deadliest roller coaster in the ninth world yeah i'll go with you okay yeah let's go to the roller coaster all right two of you head off to piper's pit to see the greatest stage nano in existence and the other two of you head off to a roller coaster that is certain death And as you split up and agree to meet back later, the view of us as an audience goes back a little bit, and we see hiding behind one of the alleyways and staring at you the back of a classic trench coat and a trilby hat. And the hand grabs the trilby hat, pushes it down on their face, and walks out of view. Isn't roulette the best? Yeah. God. I, at least it's not inside a space whale anymore, because Kyle was like, this isn't a space whale, Tom. You're, <laughs> you're fucking dumb. I also thought that. I was like, I bet it's inside a whale. Nope, now it's inside a space manta ray. I hyped up the space whales to Kyle, and then he actually read about them and learned that it was all a lie. <laughs> I mean, they're kind of like whales. A little bit. You know, shaped like manta rays. No, they're just manta rays, Tom. They're like space whales, but shaped like manta rays and <laughs> I, with no whoa. whale-like features. I was excited because I was going to, like, have these giant gold, these giant white arches that were clearly the whale's ribs. It's a space whale. It doesn't have ribs. Like, it could have ribs. Why wouldn't a space whale have ribs? I mean, I don't know. Just because you're in space doesn't mean you don't have basic anatomy. It, it could be very different in space. It could be. No, it could be. But it could also not be. 